The next kind of diffraction we'll consider is double slit diffraction. So here are some animations. This is a single slit and then some very thin slits and some thicker slits. So here we have a single slit diffraction with basically circular waves, double slit diffraction with thin slits and double slit diffraction with thicker slits. So what we see for the single slit is the basically circular wave. For double slits that are very thin, these look now like point sources and we see constructive and destructive interference lines. For the thicker slits, we see something very similar, but the shape is distorted. So this is a very complicated situation here where we're dealing not only with the shape of the slit, but also this interference in the far field, the far field meaning a long way from the slits. This situation, however, is something that we've basically already treated, because if we have two point sources here, this interference pattern is something we've calculated before. Because in the video about interference, we looked at the interference of two point sources, and this is what it looked like. We calculated the angles for constructive and destructive interference. And we found what the condition was for constructive interference in the, in the far field. I'm going to show you now a much simpler derivation for that condition. If we imagine waves propagating a long way from the slits, so the distance to the, the, the position over here where we're considering the interference is a long way from this, these slits over here. What we require for constructive interference is that this path length difference here, x, so this is the difference in path length for light coming from this slit compared to light coming from this slit, this path length difference here is an integer number of wavelengths. So x, which is d sine theta, must be equal to some integer number of wavelengths, m times lambda. And if that is true, we'll have constructive interference. The reason why we have any waves traveling this direction at all is because when it comes through this slit, it behaves like a point source and diffracts, and so we have waves traveling in all directions after this slit. And in some directions, we'll get constructive interference, in other directions, destructive interference. So basically, the double slit looks like the two point sources, but we blank out half of the screen, and there we have the double slit diffraction pattern. Now, if this works for two slits, it also works for many, many slits, hundreds, thousands even, or millions, I guess. So here we have lots of slits. We have light coming into, or waves, doesn't have to be light, any waves coming into these slits, and these slits will behave like point sources. If the path length difference between these successive slits is an integer number of wavelengths, then in the far field, off in this particular direction here, we'll have constructive interference. When x, the path length difference, is equal to the integer number of wavelengths. So this condition for constru constructive interference is true for two slits, three slits, as many slits as you like, really, as long as the light arriving at the screen is coming in perpendicular to the screen. If the light coming in here were at some angle, then each of these slits would have a phase difference between them and you need to recalculate. We're not going to treat that situation. Now here's some nomenclature. So in this equation here, we see that m lambda is d sine theta. m is the number of wavelengths difference in this path length here. So it can be an integer number of wavelengths for constructive interference. So it means we have, for diffraction, we have different orders. m equal to 0 would be the case where the path length difference is 0. So that would be light traveling straight ahead, so it's symmetric from these slits. Traveling off in this direction, we have m equal to plus 1. So the path length difference from, selective, from successive slits is one wavelength. This would be two wavelengths. In the other direction, we have m equal to minus 1, m equal to minus 2. So that would be extra path from slits on this side compared to this side. So these are called uh, the diffraction orders, and we give them this index m. And m being the number of wavelengths difference between the paths from, slits, from successive slits. A different way of doing many slit diffraction is not to use slits, but rather to use reflection. So if you have a mirror here, but the mirror has regular lines ruled into it, or little lumps at regular intervals, and the distance between these lumps or these, these ruled lines is d, then the light reflecting off these little points here will also reflect into spherical waves, and then we get diffracted light from reflection, and the condition is exactly the same. So rather than light being transmitted through the screen, we can put regular lines on the screen and get 
diffraction on reflection. The actual shape of this uh, surface here doesn't really matter. I can make it sinusoidal as long as the period between these lumps is d, the condition is the same. The actual shape of the pattern is not so crucial. Just as long as it's periodic, this will work in the same way. So the final thing I'll mention is that the angle of diffraction here, because it depends on the wavelength, it means that if you shine white light down at this grating, then you'll get all the different colours being diffracted at different angles. So much in the same way that a prism can separate white light into the different colours, a diffraction grating can be used to do the same thing. Which is great because prisms are heavy and made of glass, and if you want to separate colours, diffraction gratings are often much cheaper and lighter and easier to use. The only complication is that you have this M here, so that you have different orders of diffraction, so you've got to be careful that different colours don't start overlapping with each other if you have one diffraction order overlapping with another at different wavelengths. Now the diffraction we've considered up until this point has all been one-dimensional, so we've had some one-dimensional array of slits or lines or some periodic pattern like this and thought about light being sprayed off sort of in this plane here. But diffraction can get really complicated. A really great example of how complicated diffraction can get is this. This is a virtual keyboard. The way a virtual keyboard works is you have a little box that sits on your desk, you have a laser inside, the laser shines through a diffraction grating, and the diffraction pattern you get from that grating, in this case, makes this image of a keyboard. Now this box also has motion sensors in it, so as you move your fingers around the keyboard it figure out, figures out which letters you're hitting. Um, but that's not the important part for this Waves and Optics course. The interesting thing that we should all be looking at now is that you can design a diffraction grating to get you a picture of a keyboard. So there's actually some really neat mathematical tools for your transforms that we cover in second year to allow you to calculate what the diffraction pattern of any given arbitrary shape is and furthermore you can run the whole process backwards so if you want a keyboard you can design the grating that will give you one. In light of what we've just talked about before with different wavelengths the size of this keyboard now will vary depending on the color of the laser here so you can think about whether a green laser would give you a bigger or smaller keyboard.